everyone, and welcome to the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station, Salt Lake City, Utah. We're here once again with another edition of the Cameron Files, live right here on KGRA. And uh, as the snow has subsided here in uh, in the greater Salt Lake area, we've had quite a bit of it here uh, as of late. And i got to be honest with you, every time... Um, I got out in it, or I looked out the window and saw the snow. I was reminded of you, Grant. There you go. <laughs> Desta even said, uh, your your intrepid uh, assistant even said, um, you know, that she saw the pictures on Facebook, and now we've got snow just like you guys. There you go. There we go. Yeah. How's everything going up there, brother? Everything's going well. Yeah, fantastic. It's a little bit cooler, a little bit cooler than the last time I talked to you, but everything's going well. Good, good, good. Okay, you've got a great guest on. Tell us, uh, tell us who's uh, going to be coming on the show. Yeah, I got uh, my good friend Doug Alt, who I've known for a number of years, and you're talking about snow. So I know Doug has got the hockey game going in the back. He's background. He's big. Mike <laughs> fan. It's zero, zero there, and uh, I appreciate him coming on my show tonight because he's big. Uh, hockey fan, he could be doing something more valuable, like the Winnipeg Jets, who are playing just down the road from him in New York there. And he has decided to join me to talk about UFOs. He's got some absolutely unbelievable stories um, from a different number of different fields. So maybe we'll maybe get into it because he's got he's done a lot of stuff. He's talked to a lot of people, and uh, a lot of people really don't know who he is, but they'll know after tonight. Okay. Well, you know, I just want to extend my apologies because at the last minute there was some, confu- some confusion about a musical piece that's going to be added to the show, and it's four minutes, five seconds long. We we're going we're to have this queued up and ready to go for you guys, so whenever you're ready, just let us know, and we'll fire it away. Okay. All right. Uh, take it away, Grant. Good evening. It's December the 4th, 2018. This is Grant Cameron, and you're listening to The Cameron Files. As always, thank you for taking some of your valuable time to listen. Tonight, I'm joined by a good friend, Doug Ald. He is an artist, a musician, and an experiencer from New Jersey. Uh, Doug and I have spent many hours talking on the phone and trying to figure out all the UFO answers. And tonight, Doug and I will talk music, art, his sightings, and his contact with a rumored key government official. So good evening, uh, Doug, and thanks for taking time from your hockey game, which I know you're probably watching in the background there, to uh, join me to talk about some UFO stuff. Uh, nice to talk to you, Grant. And no, I'm not watching, so I'm counting on you to give me the score okay. as we go along because I, I don't have it on. I'm actually concentrating on this. Okay, so it's one nothing Montreal. You're doing good. All it's, right. It just scored. Okay, so anyway. Uh, let me start with uh, something people may not know. Uh, you live in New Jersey, right across the river from New York. And uh, just to, for a couple of seconds, can you talk about your involvement with 9-11? You actually saw the event happen, correct? Uh, yeah, I actually was on my rollerblades that morning. I had rolled down to near the water and I was uh, get getting myself a cup of coffee. And I was sitting outside, and, uh, well, those days are gone now. I was sitting outside, uh, blissfully ignorant of the problems of the world. And uh, uh, somebody came out of the coffee shop and said, uh, oh, a plane hit the World Trade Center. I went, what? Are you kidding me? And people were looking around, and I rollerbladed right down to the water. And, I mean, right there, I'm right across the river from the Trade Center. So the wind was blowing uh, south. And um, I could see the gaping hole in the first building and everyone was just scratching their head going, how the hell could a pilot be so stupid to fly that low to hit the World Trade Center? And at that time, no one had suspected anything else. And uh, and then I see this plane. This is a funny thing. And I've told people this. I saw this plane down south uh, from where I was coming across the uh, sky. And I remember distinctly saying to myself, oh, look, a military plane is coming like a gray military plane. That's what it looked like to me. It did not look like a passenger jet. But again, I'm not saying I was that close, but I wasn't really that far away either. And I saw it come across and then it disappeared from behind the building. And then boom, you see the explosion because it came in from on the second building from the other side. At that point, People were wailing and falling on the ground and crying and cursing and, you know, and and we basically kind of right then and there knew uh, this was a an attack of some sort. And uh, so that's uh, 
that was my witness to what happened. And it's very, very, very unusual. Uh, going to UFOs, how did you get into the UFO game? Because you would not really associate usually an artist or a musician as, as being involved in UFOs. How did you get dragged into this story? Uh, well, I, I think all my life, I mean, I grew up watching all these great shows, you know, Outer Limits, Twilight Zone, uh, all the chiller theaters, anything that had to do with science fiction always fascinated me. But my brother Greg and I, uh, he Greg reminds me of a story when I we were kids uh, out in Paramus, New Jersey, where we were living, where he saw a UFO in the sky. And I was with him, but I had run in the house, he says. I ran in the house and he talked he talked about it and I talked about it, but it's extremely fuzzy thing for me. I can't really recall it. And um, I just don't remember it. But it always bothers me that that there's a blank little moment of time there. Not that I'm trying to turn this into any kind of abduction or anything. But um, that was one of the early things that had happened. But I don't know. All all my life, I've been fascinated with science, mechanics, how things work. You know, why are we here? There's got to be millions of other life forms. It's just always seemed to be a natural thing for me. So I think it was an outgrowth of uh, my entire interest in, uh, you know, science fiction and Star Trek and all the movies that were out uh, through uh, while growing up. Uh, and so it grew out of that. And it really culminated in me reading a book uh, by uh, William Cooper, <clears throat> Behold a Pale Horse. Yeah. And that I read that and I was just in awe. Somehow everything just kind of smacked together of this being a real thing uh, that um, is something that's going on that uh, is for some reason going is being kept behind the scenes. And so that was really the catalyst of it after growing up was uh, the Bill Cooper book. OK. And and you've done a lot of. um a lot of photography in terms of seeing objects. Can you describe that? Because um, you're you've got more than most people that I know in terms of happening to happening to be in the right place at the right time. And you've done a lot of photography. Can you talk about that? Sure. I, I uh, own several cameras, and um, I decided to start uh, bringing one with me all the time. Um, and, uh, I'm a person that looks up all the time. I walk around in the town where everyone's got their head down and I got my head up and, uh, I look like an oddball looking in the sky all the time. Like, you know, what's going on here, but, uh, you're never going to see anything unless you look up in the sky, number one. And I started to doing, uh, started doing that and tried to at least uh, have a camera in the car. Um, or my iPhone on me. And fortunately with the new, ca- with the new phones, the camera quality is pretty good considering it's just a camera you're carrying around in your phone. Uh, so I started carrying, uh, you know, cameras with me and I bought a night vision set up for the evenings and I would use it here. And my buddy, John and I, uh, we go to, um, Mexico, we have a place there and I sit on the rooftop and I'll watch the sky through the night vision. So it's an interesting thing to talk about because I'm not sure if I'm catching them or they're catching me. I I don't know which one it is. Like, am I, is there something about my participation in the willingness to see them that makes them appear? I'm not, I don't really know. Uh, it's, it's, it's just something I think about, but I do catch a lot of things in the sky. It's quite remarkable. And by the way, just to let you know, uh, Grant, I did add a, um, a link to my website where I, where I put up seven UFO photographs. So any of the listeners, if they want to go and see some of the things I've captured, I have the, um, it's my website with a little uh, link on it. I can tell you that. And that's Doug Alt. The website is Doug Alt. Is that but, the one? You're but it's uh, yes, it's www.dougald.com forward slash UFO. And if you you got to put the forward slash UFO in there, and if you'll just see an empty page with about five or seven photos of different things I've captured, close ups of them. And and most of your stuff is daylight, correct? Well, I do catch a lot of things in the day. Yeah, I, um, uh, one of them looked like a bright star sitting still in the sky. And, uh, it was amazing. It was like a big bright star. I'm like, what is a star doing out at this time? And it wasn't moving. I'm just watching it. I ran in, got the camera, came out, started to photograph it. And I would never have known it until I brought it back, uh, brought the shots back in, downloaded it on the, on the uh, Apple 
and opened it up and, and enlarged them, that whatever this was, it was taking different configurations. It was not just a singular item. It was like eight, eight squarish looking balls. And then they came together and then they separated and then they came back together again. But they made alignments, perfectly uh, straight alignments and angles that, you know, forget it. Don't, you know, if, you, if somebody thinks they're balloons, try letting balloons go in the sky and see if they do that. Uh, they'll never do it. And, they, and it's that stationary the wind was moving, the clouds were moving one way, it didn't move, and then it drifted to the left, and then it drifted back over the city, and I lost it. So, uh, yeah, that's one example of many things that I captured during the day. Do you, you figure you might be part of um, the mystery where they're they're doing this just for you? Uh, I, you know what? It's an impossible to, to answer, but I will tell you about the, the uh, sighting that I just mentioned. When I, when I brought it in and got all the photos sized and enlarged and put a compilation together. I sent a group of photos out to friends, to people, and so-and-so. And that is the first time within several days, and this was absolutely eerie, I do not exaggerate, there was a Black Hawk, Black Hawk helicopter over my building oh. in Hoboken, New Jersey, the first time I have ever seen that, and I mean low. And in fact, the only reason why I knew a Black Hawk helicopter was there, it was so loud it was right over my building. And I went out in the back. I was ready to leave to get coffee. I went out in the back and I saw it right above me. It was looking like right down at me where I was in the parking area. And I was like, what in God's name is happening? I got in my car. I left and I went to the coffee shop and it was over the coffee shop. Wow. So weird. that was it. Never heard another thing uh, in regards to that, but I did send the sighting to a gentleman named Antonio Paris, who had a, uh, a, you, I don't know if anybody knows that name, but, um, he, uh, he was very avid in, in examining UFOs and he spent a good long time on this particular image. And, um, he checked all satellites, all kinds of data from airports and everything you can think of. And it remains unexplained. Wow. And just briefly, can you talk about you had set up some uh, cameras in your security cameras and you got something going on there as well, but you pulled them. Yeah, I pulled that out. I actually think I, I think that's uh, up in the air. And actually, Princess Aaliyah and I discussed uh, what I shot there and we came to the conclusion it's probably dust. Okay. And so even though it looked like it was rather compelling, I would have to study it some more. But uh, but, you know, with those little tiny um, cameras, the way they work. If you have dust flying in the lens, they can give you the, that impression. So I let that whole idea go. And I also wanted to get the Wi-Fi out of my apartment. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to the analysis of some of your photos later, but let's go to um, your association with artists, uh, with art. And I always sort of make a joke when you put stuff on the internet that you're always posting photographs and then trying to say you painted them. You're you're kind of a better artist than, than the average guy. Uh, can you tell me what's the most you ever sold an art piece for? Because uh, there's all sorts of rumors I heard. Yeah, no, I, I was I was amazingly fortunate to sell, and, and, and this was privately, so think about the fact that this has no gallery cut or anything. I was amazingly uh, um, happy to sell a painting for $100,000. It was a diptych meaning two canvases side by side. And uh, it was uh, through through um, a contact from my buddy John, who I just mentioned, who put me in touch with a, a gentleman who had a lot of sympathy for burn survivors because he spent yeah. some time in a burn hospital. And he wanted to give back something and do something in, in light of that. So he decided to buy this big uh, painting of these two sisters, Rebecca and Louise, which was a heartbreaking story about uh, a family that uh, that mainly most of them perished in a fire. And Rebecca and Louise survived with severe, severe burns. And I, I painted both of them uh, as two portraits for a project I had called State of Grace which was intending to make comment on how we are more than our bodies. We are more than our physicality. Our physicality is very fragile, but we go on and we live on. And uh, these two women are sensationally amazing women. One is a lawyer now. One has a uh, degree, I believe, in, uh, in psychology, a doctorate. And uh, wow, I mean, no fingers, missing legs. Uh, they're inspirational people. So to answer you in a long way, yes, I sold yeah. the, that painting for a hundred thousand. So you do the burn victim. Why? Why the burn victims? 
did, what, what was that all about? Why did you do all those? That's one of your collections, and we'll talk about yeah, your... Yeah, one of my collections. I've done several, you know, I've always, uh, Grant, ever since I've been painting, I've always wanted to uh, kind of, all my work has a sort of a, what I call a soft activism, yeah. uh, a, a, a participation in the world in, in, you know, wishing for a better world or wishing things weren't the way they were. And so I like to make comments in all my art, whether it's painting or music or whatever. I like to uh, kind of uh, raise question marks and challenge uh, certain certain notions. So I did a series of paintings on nuns and priests, which is which uh, circles around religion and uniform, because uniform, we're very affected by our exteriors and our uniform, okay. and uh, the uniform changes how people react to us. The burn survivors happen to be something that started with me after 9-11 when I was sort of asking the heavens, what should I do with the skills that I have? What could I do that would make an impact? And a memory of a young girl that I had seen many years ago who was severely burned came to me at that moment. And that's when I decided to say, you know what, that's what I'm going to look into. And then I contacted uh, contacted my friend, Brian Green, I play hockey with, who is a fireman. He um, contacted me to uh, a burn center and it all began from there. I took burn, uh, burn uh, victim volunteers and they all volunteered for my, pro- uh, my project. And this collection is on your website as well, correct? Yes, everything is on the DougAld.com website. All, all 40 years of my work, I've put up every, pretty much every series of work that I've ever done is on the site. And the most recent is the Whistleblower series that we can yeah. discuss. Yeah. Prior- Let's talk about that now. Yeah. So um, anyway, so yeah, the Whistleblower series, again, you know, when I finished the when I finished the uh, burn survivors, the burn survivors were large, very labor intensive um, paintings, all, all oil on canvas. Um, and I went to all their homes. I talked to them. I met them and I studied them and photographed them because the paintings are so time consuming. There's no way any, any way in in this modern era I could sit in front of a, an artist and have their portrait done for that length of time. So um, but when I was done with that series of work. I wanted to take on another series, but I wanted to take it on in a different style. So I made them small portraits, nine by 12, but I made 100 portraits as one body of work. So I became, you know, since I've been coming, I've been been becoming more fascinated with this topic of ufology and, and whistleblowing and black ops and all the stuff that everybody's discussing. I started to learn about these people and they became a fascination to me about what a great, what, what great, uh, portraits these would make because most people don't know who they are. And yet these people are going through some sort of sacrifice or, or, or putting their ne- neck out for what they believe in, whether it's a scam or not, was not my business to try to ascertain. It was my business to say that these people are making rather loud comments about something that's really out there. And I was very, very moved by why they were so passionate about it. Uh, Grant, you being one of them, because I appreciate um, that. Yeah. You, you know, the Charlie Red Star uh, incident is a fascinating incident. I think it's I think it's a sighting that's not even discussed enough, in my opinion. But, you know, that's why you're in the uh, the series. And look what you do. Look how it changed your life or like Colin Andrews with the yeah. drop circles. So that's so I went and I did 100 portraits that loosened up the detail a bit, but but keyed in on the emotion and the intuition I had about these people and what they were doing. And that collection is on my website also. And and you you were trying to move it into a, a national art gallery. Can you go through what where is it going to go or what are you planning for this big collection? Well, well, what I did, you know, the National Portrait Gallery has a certain portrait competition every three or four years or so. It's called the Outwin Bukover Portrait Competition. I actually got into that competition in 2006, 2007 with one of my burn survivor portraits, uh, a girl named Shayla, a 14 year old girl. And you can see her on the site. Um, who was severely burned. And uh, that was in that show. And that got a lot of attention and, you know, some r- right up in the Washington Post and on and on. And then I went to um, Germany because of all of what was going on and, and uh, uh, with the publicity around that. And my friend uh, put me, Charlie put me in touch with someone from the New York Times and the New York Times came out and did a two page spread on that story. So it got a lot of publicity. 
Well, this series I did, and I figured, okay, National Portrait Gal- Gallery, 100 portraits, what, what better perfect piece of work to hang in the National Portrait Gallery, especially with the topic. But they didn't accept it. Uh, I was encouraged at first to, uh, to enter all 100. And then I thought about it. I was a little disappointed, but then I thought about the fact that maybe there are some people in this series of work that are a little edgy, a little against what the very um, funding of the government, uh, the government funding for that museum is accustomed to funding for, uh, people like Julian Assange and uh, Eric Snowden and, and and many others that are quite controversial. And maybe they just decided to pass for that reason. I'll never really know. But um, I didn't get the series of work into that show, which was uh, coming up uh, in 2019. Have you got any plans for it? What you want? What- well, well, uh, one good thing is uh, the uh, editor of Penn Magazine, P-E-N-N, which is an online magazine, mm-hmm. uh, contacted me and they dedicated 100 pages. This is amazing. I was really thrilled with this, that uh, Mike at Penn dedicated 100 pages of his Penn online magazine to my uh, portrait. So December issue, which just came out. P-E-N-N magazine, that magazine is carrying all 100 portraits with a description of each person um, under the painting. And then, of course, you go to my website and you can read the rest. So that's uh, that's where, where it's out and where it's documented now. And that's being carried by a lot of different sites, uh, you know, like Jim Fetzer and so on, who are carrying it. And um, uh, as far as the show, the work itself goes... I think I'd like to try to arrange to either place it in a collection somewhere or have it be part of a traveling exhibit through universities or whatever. So anyone out there that has any ideas or would like to offer something on that is always welcome to uh, to reach me. And what percentage of your 100 whistleblowers would be UFO related? Pretty good percentage. I, I'm just going to guess about 60 percent, maybe more. Um I've covered a lot of different people, some, you know, and and the other thing is, and I want everyone out there to know that this is no way a comprehensive work. I had to leave a lot of people off that I would have liked to have included. And um, if I had, if I could do another series of them, I could easily do 500 more. That's how many people are out there that um, aren't included, you know, various people that I, that I would have liked to. But once I got to the hundred, I had to end it somewhere. I decided to do that. So the 100 portraits are in no way uh, meant to blight out somebody that could have been included or should have been there. And there's probably some people in there that don't even belong to be in there as much as others. But um, they're the ones that came across my radar when I started the project. And I was, and, and it really did doing this, doing this series really helped me to learn about the community. And I ended up meeting people and yeah. like you, Grant, and uh, yeah. uh, Dan Willis. I spoke to Dan today. who's become a good friend. Uh, Chris Bloodsoe is in the, uh, yeah. Uh, the thing and uh, Andrew Johnson in in uh, the United Kingdom. So there's a lot of people in there that I became friends with. And you even got some recognition from not directly from Bob Bigelow, but you did get some reaction back when you did his, right? Yeah. Well, uh, his secretary showed it to him, and they liked it. And he asked about the price of it, uh, but I told him it's not for sale. I said the entire collection is for sale. I don't want to break this series up. Yeah into individual paintings and individual sales. It's more important, and I think it will be more historic uh, in the long run if it's kept as 100 portraits and all hung in a configuration of either like 50 by 50, one on one side and another, or 100 and all in one square. Uh, any, or they could go all the way around the room. So it's got a lot of options, but I, I'm, I'm planning on keeping the 100 portraits as one series of work. And it is for sale, but I just haven't really been active in, in looking to place it with any collector or anything like that. Okay. So you, you're a very talented guy and your latest project, let's go to that. You have decided you're going to do a Broadway musical on UFOs. Cause so you can describe where this idea came from, uh, what the, uh, the sort of the objective of and who the characters are and where you are in the project. Okay. Well, um, I think uh, I th- something came over me about returning to music. I studied classical piano many years ago when I was in my 20s. And um, 
I let it go and preferred to paint because my brother Greg and I had a band uh, back then. And we were in this band and we played in CBGBs in the city. And, you know, we were but we were like a difficult band. We were mostly in the garage and never really getting out there. So I decided that I didn't want to work with people. I wanted to work by myself. And that's where the art came in. And I took to, you know, staying in a room and staying in a studio and just started studying painting. And I really enjoy working by myself. But after all these years and doing all the series of work that I've done, I pretty much at this stage of my life said I've painted everything and said everything I want to say with my work. <clears throat> so I decided uh, it's actually funny. My son, Brian, took up the guitar and we went, walked into a Sam Ash music store and I started looking at the pianos. Well, I took up the piano again. He gave up the guitar, but it helped to get me into the music studio uh, store. So I would start playing again. And when I did that, I started playing and writing songs and I enjoyed writing lyrics and writing songs. And anytime anyone would hear my work, if I sent it to my family or so on, everyone would kind of say, well, it's sort of like Broadway. -ish. That's what it sounds like. So this grew into the idea of, well, maybe, you know, maybe I could maybe I should write a show of some sort. So Grant, this is where the dreaming comes in because, um, in the middle of the night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had been thinking, you know, I, I actually, that night I wasn't even thinking about the music, but I woke up in the middle of the night, like four o'clock in the morning. And I just kind of sat up and said a word. And the word was hypnota, H Y P N O T T A. <clears throat> hypnota. I had never heard the word before. Now, where that came from, I'll never know. But it was sort of popped into my mind or downloaded into my head. And it just kind of told me that's the name of your show. So how do you like that? Yeah. I said, OK, good enough. I'm going to start <laughs> with that. And uh, and and so I started to look at all my music and I started to tailor it around um, the concept of lucid dreaming, out of body experiences, the hypnagogic and hypnopopic state um, UFOs and the unknown. And I, I, and I thought, you know, I don't know if this has ever really been done on Broadway, but I, it made a very big impression on me when I went to see Miss Saigon of a helicopter coming down on the stage. I was like, Holy crow. This is, this is amazing. Uh, like how effective the sound and everything was. And then, you know, I was thinking, well, what if that was a UFO? What if that was like a white disc coming down all out of the rafters of a stage to an audience that is like not in the UFO community, but a average everyday theater going audience. This would be an amazing thing to introduce to them. And if I had really compelling music, which needs to be in a musical and a great story, uh, this could really be an impactful thing. And once I made the commitment to it, which was in early this year of 2018, I've been working on it ever since. Wow. And, wh and where are you at in it? I'm, I would say I'm about nine song concepts in, not all sung because I don't, I don't sing. That's my biggest curse. I wish I could sing, <clears throat> but I can't, and I need to get singers. So they're hard to get sometimes, but I have a wonderful singer named Shia who has just sung a song for me um, that hopefully we're going to play. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and uh, that song is about that song is out of my show. And it's a part where two women, two experiencers um, are going to be regressed by their therapist. And um, so that's what the song is going to be about. It's called rolling on back, rolling back in time. And uh, we'll play that in a few minutes. But uh, I just want to add, uh, Grant, that that um, I'm about nine or 10 songs into it and about 40 pages of dialogue written. Um, but I've become friends with Nancy Tremaine, who you know, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah and yeah. Then, and Nancy and I are, are conversing back and forth. And I'm what I'm doing with the show is I'm patterning a, a sampler of different UFO events that, that are on record that we all in the community know, like the Ariel School or the Westall School. Yeah. Um, Nancy Tremaine, Chris Bledsoe, uh, there's a number of them that I'm grabbing a little essence of each one of them. And I'm not necessarily copying anything. I'm not putting, you know, it's not the aerial school in, in Zimbabwe. It's a school somewhere with school kids somewhere. And uh, it can be a combination of Westall or just out of my imagination. But it's based on reality of 
these documented sightings. So Nancy has shared with me her story about Cindy. And oddly enough, Cindy, it's uh, Cindy, sadly, was her dear friend that was with this in, in the sighting with her. Yeah. And um, and in the event and Cindy uh, died of alcoholism. So I don't know. Um, you know, that's the story with her. So I'm writing the my characters, which are Nectar and Jilly. Nectar is my main character and Jilly is almost like the Cindy character. I'm writing them into my show. <clears throat> and the um, the song Rolling on Back is about the two of them being regressed. And oddly enough, it is Cindy's birthday today. Um, so it's her birthday. She's no longer with us, but, uh, when we do play the song, I dedicate it to her. Okay. Well, maybe we should play the show right now or play the song right now. Just one last question before, what does it cost to put on a Broadway musical? It must be big money. Well, I'm going to throw a, a, a guess of $10 million. Um, wow. so I don't know if you want to start the PayPal or the, oh. We might get a, somebody with 10 million bucks. <laughs> we may get someone with 10 million, but um, yeah, it's a lot of money, but you know, it, it, it's a process. And uh, once you get something that's realized enough and strong enough in its content, um, I think the people will arrive. I think the right people will arrive and see that maybe this is something worth taking a shot on. And um, I like to think of it in terms of West side story meets ET because um, West Side Story has a compelling love story in it. And my, so, my show will also have a romantic uh, side of it um, where two people are separated and, and uh, ha- tr- are trying to find a way to get back to each other. But it's also about this very topic of disclosure and uh, the forces involved that we're all discussing of what is holding disclosure back. We know something to be real, but we just can't seem to break through and have it made. Is it being held back for our own good? Have world governments decided to collectively hold this material so that the average person can't know about it? And will this ever change? Okay, so let's play. uh, Race, can you play the song? And then we'll go to um, the last segment of the show where we talk about one of the characters in the in the uh, Broadway show that uh, Doug has been involved with. Okay, so there's one of the songs from the uh, upcoming Broadway musical. And in connection to this, um, a lot of it's based upon sort of characters. And there's one sort of aspect and a character that I got Doug dragged into. I sort of apologize for that. (laughs) And he sort of jumped in with both feet. I sort of sit on the sidelines and sort of watch. Uh, Doug actually got involved. So maybe talk about... Uh, your connection with uh, the the Pandolfis and uh, the reaction you've gotten and how they fit into this whole uh, scenario, because a lot of people are are interested in this. And you probably are the closest in terms of knowing who they are and uh, what they are as people. Uh, Yeah. Okay. so uh, Ron and Princess have um, uh, taken me into uh, their world as a friend. And I, I've stayed at their home several times and we've become good friends. And Princess Celia and I have a great relationship that is really mainly centered around creativity, um, art, music, uh, life, uh, Kashmir, their daughter. We talk about Kashmir a lot and, um, we've really become great friends. We, we, we have a, a an outlook on life. That's very simpatico. We seem to get along pretty well. As far as Ron goes, Ron um, has been, you know, they both have been wonderful to me. They both have great, great senses of humor. Ron has a great sense of humor, whether people know or not. But uh, Ron is a very enigmatic and, and uh, you know, difficult guy to know. I mean, I've, I've been clear with everybody about this. You know, anyone can ask me what I do all day. Well, what'd you work on today? I, I just can't go up to Ron and go, so how was your day? Tell me what you did. I, <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way, you know, although he has, you know, at times said things to me that were very fascinating. Um, it's, you know, his, his job is, I don't even know what he does. I really, I I have rumor about what he does. I've heard people say he's, you know, head of the weird desk at the CIA. He's this, he's that, whatever he is, that all may be true, but I can't verify it for myself. And, um, so, you know, we've, we've just become, friends where we're able to get along with each other and everything seems to be pretty, pretty calm and pretty cool. And, uh, we have mutual respect for each other. So that's how that kind of began, but it's mostly around, uh, like I said, princess Aaliyah and I 
talk almost probably every week or every few days about a number of things. And a lot of it is creativity and and uh, and art, music and her daughter and so on. And she's 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 a, um, an artist. I've seen some of her stuff. It's pretty good. Not yeah. quite your your level, but she's pretty good. Well, we, we're working together and I'm going to help uh, help to teach her um, uh, the approach that I use in portraiture. And we're going to probably get going on that uh, with it. You know, in the early year, we're going to get one of those like Skype, you know, the cameras up and I'll have a camera over my shoulder on my canvas and she'll have a setup like mine and we'll work together. And I'd like to I think I could help her get going on some of the methods that I did. So. Um, you know, we'll get we'll get on to that. But, uh, you know, I'm always present and aware to the whole other topic when I'm with them. And um, and it comes up every now and then about, you know, portals and about the concept of it. And uh, Joe D- at the lake. And uh, I spoke to Dan Smith today, who is uh, a lot of fun and <laughs> in his own in usual, unusual way. And, um, you know, we were do- discussing some things going on at the lake and Kevin and, and Joe and so and so. So, it you know, between me being friends with them, uh, but not making this topic a priority, it's made it rather relaxed. And, and um, I think it, I think it's been very beneficial. And, and Ron has analyzed your photographs, correct? Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, I, I asked him when I was over at the house, uh, I think it was last year, I said to him, Ron, would you, would you take a look at my UFO photos? He's like, sure. So he sat there, he grabbed, the ca- he grabbed my, uh, my computer, and when I tell you he, he looked at the photos, it wasn't like, oh, those are cool, and handed it back to me. He had to spend 10 to 15 minutes on each one of them, turning his head, looking at them this way, looking at them that way. Ron is one of the most intense people I've ever met as far as when he wants to look or study at something, he has a methodology that's just not that easy to, you know, most people don't have that. He's, he's a unique guy and he really, really studied them and looked at them. And uh, he never said a word to me about, well, that's a balloon or that's fake or that's a, you know, a pigeon or anything like that. Uh, and in one, he actually remarked enough to uh, call uh, Aaliyah over, and they looked at it, and both of them smiled. I, I always wanted to ask Aaliyah, why were they laughing? Why were they smiling? Because he said, "Hun, this looks a little bit like so-and-so. I forgot what he said. And she looked, and she smiled. Um, so he was very attentive to them. He gave he gave them, you know, me respect in that, that he looked at them, and he uh, he thought they were pretty uh, pretty fascinating. Yeah. And you and I have talked about this a number of times, what people maybe don't catch, even though this is guy, maybe the top UFO guy in the in the government. Um, when you talk with them, it, the subject almost never came up, correct? When I well, when I, I mean, we've been we've been we've laid on the grass for a picnic. We've done this. We've done that. I, I flew one of their small little drones. It was so cold out. I was trying to learn it. And Ron wanted me to see if I could learn to fly the little drone. And, you know, we've gone to look at, you know, different things together and gone into town together. Uh, the three of uh, the four of us, Kashmir and I, sometimes if Dan is there. But um, no, I'm not like, so Ron, what about this? And what about MJ-12? I, I don't do that. I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't feel it's my place. And um and if he wants to offer a little something to me, I'm all ears. But even at that, he's told me some things. And then I, I remember the first time when I was over, I said, uh, um, Ron, do you think I could kind of tell Grant that? And he's like, <laughs> oh, he goes, yeah, 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 that's OK. You could tell Grant. He goes, but just anything that I tell you not to mention, just don't mention. And, um, you know, right away, I just let that stuff go out of my head anyway. But, um, you know, he. Um, the only thing he's the only thing he's ever said to me was I asked him uh, not about a specific sighting or anything, but I said, "Is the phenomena real?" And he, I remember him walk past, he walking past me, and he said, "Yes." So that's that's something that he told me. And you know, when I've talked to Dan Smith, um, Dan Dan right in, right in front of him, he'll be sitting there. He'll go, "Well, you know, Doug." Uh, Ron is paid to lie to you. So I start <laughs> laughing. I'm like, because Princess is sitting right there and she's smiling and he's saying that. And I'm like, man, I don't know what to think about any of this. But um, uh, bottom line, Grant, is that uh, they treat me very well and uh, they're very kind to me. I can't say what they've been like to other people. I know that they've been uh, 
I know that uh, our our mutual friend Chris had had a difficult situation with uh, Dan. Um, yeah. I don't really know the the bottom line on that, but uh, I'm a good friend with Chris, and Chris is a great guy, and um, you know I'm very protective of him, and I don't really want to see anything happen to Chris if I can help it. But um, you know that's where it sits. Yeah. And you, you have taken some backlash that that is true. And and so I, I, again, I sort of apologize for that, but you are, uh, you've done some stuff like with Aaliyah, you had done some of these um, go-to meetings and you actually had one that you actually achieved something that almost nobody had is you got Joe Firmage, who was uh, this dot-com executive guy who had this being that visited him in the middle of the night in the 1990s and sort of went off the deep end and, and has been trying to get the sort of like UFO propulsion portals you actually uh, did some um shows with uh, leah uh, ron's wife in which you actually interviewed um Firmage. can you talk a little bit about that uh yeah um yeah i had a, a couple of uh moments where i was in f- where i was online with joe and um joe's a very very intense and bright guy uh, from what i can ascertain i don't 100 percent know what he's creating you know uh out there at the lake. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it in the community and, you know, uh, you've had buddy and all these different people talking about what it is. And Dan posts a lot of stuff, of course, on, uh, on open minds, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was, uh, I, I, I imagine I can only say that, uh, Aaliyah trusted me enough to be a uh, co sort of a co-host with her. And we, we, she invited, uh, she invited uh, Joe on and Joe came on and spoke about uh, some of the things he's doing and, and what he's up to. And um, they're, they're working on that right now. And I, uh, Dan says they have a new version that's supposedly ready to, you know, that's being developed or, or you know, coming forward. And uh, I don't really know. You know, some people say it's anti-gravity. Some people say it's a portal um, device. And um in fact, Dan and I were speaking about it today, and he said that um, that uh, he believes it's a portal uh, related. And then I was actually talking to Dan Willis. You know Dan, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dan, Dan, I happened to mention uh, the Salt Lake City region. He said, "Oh, that's a that's a um, that's a, a a very very powerful um, uh, line on the Earth for energy." That's uh, and he and he was unaware the Joe Firmage story. But he said, yeah, right in that Salt Lake City area is a, because he studied this on the map of uh, energy grids across the earth. And he said, oh, that's one of those areas where the, the energy is very, very high. And that got that got my attention to think, well, is the energy high uh, because of what they're doing? Or are they doing it in that area because the energy is high? That became an interesting uh, thought for myself. Now, you know, I've always been interested in the portal thing. What do you think about the portal thing? I've sort of sort of pushed you to keep your ears open about this. Do you think they have something like this? I mean, you've sort of been a little bit on the inside. Are you hopeful that maybe there's something to this uh, rather than because a lot of people are just saying, oh, this is just a big counterintelligence. Uh, you know, everybody's just being taken down the road. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I got to say that I think there's relevance to this entire story. I don't really see the upside or the uh, value in this. The story isn't disruptive enough in the UFO community to, to you know, send everybody uh, packing and not look at the sky anymore. I don't know what the purpose of the story would be if it had no um, if it had no relevance and, um, you know, we, we have seen Grant, you and I have seen that uh, that tape when he's on the uh, uh, on the cruise line and he makes that comment. Right. Yes. Yes. About going into the next world and coming back again. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and and um, I've heard comments to that degree. Um, and uh, but, you know, Princess Princess has a very interesting attitude about it, <laughs> which I kind of like. She's very cool and blase about a lot of things. And she feels that. People want to have all these answers and they haven't even taken 10 seconds to look inside their own ego, their own selves, to see their own motives. Then, you know, she feels most people are operating from their own selfish point of view, like, uh, hey, I want to be the discloser or I want to be the this, rather than a more holistic look on is this good for the world? Is it good for them? Is Are they ready for it? Would they misuse it? If it was a key into another 
dimension or another world? Would they mis- misuse it? Are they even ready for it? And uh, I think that's a really interesting um, um, a point that she's made to me, and she's gotten me to think about that quite a bit. Yeah, I know she, I heard her, especially to Dan, she'll say to Dan, why do you want disclosure? And Dan really never gives her an answer. Like, why do you really want this? And it's it's sort of this, it's bigger than just sort of an entertainment game. We want a new story, something like that. She's sort of more in depth about what, what's actually going on here. Actually, it was, we have a uh, princess and I have a funny thing. We were with Dan, we were out and she says, watch this. She goes, I'm going to ask Dan why he wants disclosure. And she said, and watch, and he'll give us an answer. And in three minutes, it will be a different answer. <laughs> and so we did it. She goes, Dan, why do you want disclosure? And he'll go, well, I want disclosure for so-and-so, so-and-so. And then a few minutes later, she's like, Dan, why do you want disclosure? And now he has a whole other answer. And she's like, because he, he doesn't really know why he wants disclosure. He wants it. She'll go, he, want, he wants it for himself. He wants to you know, put it on his blog, or he wants to be the first guy to make this happen. And that's seen as self-serving. It's seen as it's about it's all about me rather than coming out of yourself and saying what what goodness for the, the species, the world, uh, us as 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 people will. Would this be would this be something that could be handled? Would it be misused? And um, so I, I believe in my in my instincts and my intuition that there's there's something real to this. And um I don't really press uh, her on it or Ron on it. Um, I figure they'll they'll ask me when and if I'm ready. Yeah, that's that's where I, I sort of have my hopes on you that you yeah. have your head screwed on right, and that maybe at some point you may be be, be the guy who gets to uh, go into the next world and come back, and then hopefully you'll tell me about it. Yeah, well, listen, I'm 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 ready to go. I'm single. I'm uh, I, <laughs> I, I'm not beholding to anybody. Uh, my son will miss me for a little while, but I promise to come back. And uh, uh, as long as they have open hockey on the other side, I think I could do it. There you go. <laughs> OK, we've got a few minutes left. Let's go to our common friend, Chris, who uh, you've had a lot of um, encounters with him. I have. He's an amazing person. If you actually know what's going on behind the scenes. First of all, tell me about the healing, because everybody uh, doesn't really know that that Chris does these healings. I've seen him heal people, and uh, he has the everybody knows his UFO experiences. But tell the story about the when he healed you. Yeah, I can only tell you what my experience of this was. I had been playing hockey, uh, and I I had one of the worst injuries I've had in the last several years. I had a such a severe hamstring pull on the back of my leg that my entire back of my leg was like beat red with blood. And I was hobbling around. I even told him, I said, Chris, I know I'm supposed to come and see you. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Um, I'm on crutches and this and that. Well, I got close enough to the time where I was hob- hobbling around. and um, I was, I said, you know what? I got a bad limp, but I'm going to go. And I went and I saw Chris and he picked me up and we went out to lunch and this and that and everything else. And I'm hobbling around and the whole back of my leg is like killing me. And I showed it to him. It was in the warm weather. So I had my shorts on. It looked bad. So I even have pictures of it. I should post it on my UFO. Yeah. I've seen the picture. I've seen the picture. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, Chris and I, I, we said, let's, let's go down to the river where the sighting happened. So we get jumped in his truck and we're on, on our way down there. And when we pulled to park the car before we went down to the river, he scared the daylights out of me. He just took his hand and grabbed the leg and went, and he said a prayer. And he said a prayer right in front of me, out in the middle of the car. He said this prayer and, uh, you know, dear Lord, dear God, please heal my, my friend, Doug. His most sincere prayer was a very sincere prayer. It really, it really caught me. And, um, I said, thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. And we got out, we walked down to the river and came back and I went to bed that night and, um, I woke up in the morning and I, I, you listen, you know, what can you say? We, we, we so easily doubt things, but I looked, I turned around and I looked at the back of my leg and it was gone. The, the blood, the mark, that big black and blue mark was gone. And I was walking around and I'm not saying I was 100 percent, but I was like, wow, I mean, this is just amazing. Now, it could be argued it would have healed itself. I don't think so. Uh, there's something about it that really, you know, whether it was and Chris would tell you, he would say, I didn't heal you. You healed yourself. Yeah, he, he would tell you that because that's what healers 
real healers will tell you that, that it's, it's in our capacity. Uh, that woman that I know out in Shelter Island, Dr. Suzanne Mendelson, she does uh, vibrational healing, and she she rem- and she's amazing, and she reminds me of this that it's in everybody, but we we don't believe it. We don't. We I, I know I, I agree. We don't believe it. We don't believe we have these kinds of abilities to um, to heal ourselves. But uh, that's that's the story of um, of the healing situation with Chris and I. Okay, and I guess the last question as we go into uh, going for the next show here. Um, you did the famous painting for him. You actually, I think, painted his father just uh, and were the, with his father the night before he died. And then you did this famous painting about the, the uh, well, I call it the Shining Lady. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, well, I had the pleasure of meeting his father. And his father was, um, a, a, you know, real traditional, big, strong, traditional guy hardworking guy that didn't quite warm up to what was going on with his son. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't appreciate is the hell that this sighting caused Chris Bledsoe with his family, with his children, with his wife, with his mother and father and all the relatives. This was no walk in the park for him. I mean, he there has to be an easier way to make a living if you're trying to scam anybody with claiming you saw a UFO. And uh, so he went through hell. And um, I met his dad and his dad took to me and we had a really nice time around Thanksgiving. And I remember um, I gave him a big hug. And we took some photos together. And that night when I left, by the time I got to the airport, he had passed away. Wow. I was that was I was very moved by that. Um, So, you know, I just followed Chris's story. And Chris said, Doug, you know, he always said to me, even though the UFO side of the story sounded more impactful, I he always said to me, um, uh, he always said to me, you should paint the lady. And I finally took it on. And it took me about a year to get to it, but I did, and I painted the uh, the, the shining lady for him. Beautiful. So you've got that on your website as well. That's on the dougald dot com, and if if anyone goes to it, you can scroll all the way down, and at the bottom you'll see Chris, myself, and his dad with the painting. Beautiful. Thanks for all your time tonight, Doug, for your wonderful stories. Let's do it again. And um, I, I really appreciate your being a friend and and all that you, you've done to uh, help the UFO community. Uh, uh, that's great, Brent. Thanks for having me on. And thank uh, thank you very much for playing the song. I appreciate that. Beautiful. And good luck with the, with the Hollywood musical. Uh, yeah, sooner or later. It's going to take time, but uh, we'll get yeah. there. Beautiful. Okay, thank back you. to you, Race. 